everyone, welcome to the podcast. Where can you get the best medical information anytime and anywhere? Well, I hope right here on The Smartest Doctor in the Room, where I in get to interview top medical experts in their fields. I'm your host, Dr. Dean Mitchell. Now, we have all been consumed with COVID-19 and how it's impacting our lives. I don't think anybody questions that. But ironically, one of the positive ways it has influenced us is to spend more time outdoors instead of in indoor crowded spaces. However, before there was COVID, there was another menace to our health, and it was tick infections. The best, one, best known one is Lyme disease, but there are many other tick-borne infections with strange names like babesiosis, allergiosis, Anna plasmosis and Bartonella. Not easy to pronounce as Lyme disease, which is technically called Borreliosis. But my guest knows all about these things. Um, on a prior podcast, I had Dr. Brian Fallon, who's the head of Columbia's Lyme Center, where we spoke a lot about testing and treatments. And it was kind of unfortunately disappointing because there are a lack of good testing and treatments. Today, my guest is another Brian, Brian Laidit who is a true tick hunter. I read an article about Brian in the New York Times recently where he was pictured in his white hazmat suit out in the woods collecting ticks. Seems a little bit like a strange vocation, but Brian seemed very enthusiastic about his work. So I was hoping he could teach us what we need to know how to avoid these little buggers. Brian is a biologist at SUNY College of Environmental Sciences and Forestry. So it's my pleasure to welcome Brian Ledit to the podcast. Thank you, Dean, for having me. Okay, it's my pleasure. So first, Brian, I have to ask you this. I always like to know people's background. So I just <laughs> want to know, were you one of those kids in elementary school who liked collecting bugs? Or was it something about being in the outdoors, not being stuck behind a desk? How did you get into this field? Interesting story. I, I didn't get into the field till later on in my life. I, I, I grew up as a, on the East Coast of Virginia as a surfer, a little surfer kid. Um, and I, I didn't go to college out, out of high school. I was a paramedic um, for 10 oh, wow. years, actually. Um, and so got into clinical care and then decided to go. In, I wanted to go into emergency management. Um, so I got my master's of public health in uh, University of North Florida, where I met my mentor that really got me into tick-borne diseases. So not till later in life. Um, and I finished my, I, I'd studied tick-borne diseases in my master's and then my PhD at Louisiana State University. So um, no, it was kind of a weird journey, um, but I, I've been consumed by it and have been studying ticks for about 15 years now. Oh, that's, that's a pretty good amount of time to pay attention <laughs> to these little guys. You know, I got fascinated with the whole thing when I was actually in my medical residency. Uh, this was in the late 1980s. I think it was like 87, 88. And really only, and it's funny because in the hospital, we didn't really see many tick-borne illnesses. You know, there was no Rocky Mountain fever cases, or maybe there was one, you know, <laughs> out of all my four years. But um, I actually had to do a presentation to my my colleagues and I ended up ch choosing, you know, Lyme disease because it was kind of fascinating. Like here was this disease that was really, you know, it's rare that a, a new, not not anymore. It's not so rare, but back then it was kind of rare for a new illness to be discovered. And Alan Steer was a little bit of a hero of mine. The way he, you know, his background in epidemiology and his background in rheumatology kind of forged. He was the perfect person to help put that whole story together along with uh, Willie Bergdorfi, which Lyme's disease is named after, you know, in discovering the tick. Um, okay, so let me, so now that we know how you got into this and, you know, and a little bit the how and the why, you know, you were described in the Times as a tick hunter. Um, I'm not sure if that's how you would describe yourself, but <laughs> what is the purpose of your job in collecting these ticks? Well, what, are you, what are you hoping to find out? Right. So it's a, a tick hunter. Yeah, I guess I could be a tick hunter. There's a lot of us out there. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm not the only one. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bunch of us across the country, across the world. Okay. Um, what we do, you know, sampling what's going on in the environment, right? Monitoring. It's like an epidemiologist. We're monitoring disease over time. We're just monitoring tick populations and what's in the ticks over time. Um, and then we kind of look at fact, we kind of look at environments that differ and see if that changes disease prevalence in the ticks or not disease prevalence, but the pathogen prevalence in the ticks 
or the ticks themselves. Because realistically, I, I like to know what is driving expansion, um, what is driving both tick and disease expansion. And that really is uh, monitoring ticks when they're in there. Like one of our sites, we monitor ticks. They're so rare. It takes, I think um, I had a student um, to take that little white cloth you saw in the New York Times, 14 miles. And we picked up 17 ticks. Um, so these are these sound like, rare- That doesn't sound like a lot. That sounds like- uh... <laughs> it's, Oh, it's not, not much at all, right? Yeah, um, but true. these are those sites where the ticks are just establishing themselves. And it's important to understand how they can establish because once ticks establish, we're not getting rid of them right now. We don't have a way to get rid of them. Well, so, you, you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, you, you, I'm sorry, I don't even mean to interrupt you because you know, no. you're, you're, you're like leading right into my other questions. It's so fascinating <laughs> when people like read my mind because I guess my question to you is you're back in 1978, obviously there was these localized, um, I don't know if you want to call it epidemics, you know, regional issues. And now it seems like there's an explosion of ticks. And, and the reason I want to bring that out from a clinical point of view is that, you know, typically, you know, whether it was in my, I guess in my practice, that's where I was dealing more with outpatients. You know, a lot of times when somebody would complain of joint pain or, you know, or these things that I would start to concern, I typically would ask them the question, oh, did you go out on Eastern Long Island, like the Hamptons, you know, Fire Island, you know, yep. were you up in Connecticut? You know, this became like, well, no, you're not. You live in Queens, New York. No problem. This, should, this doesn't make sense. Right. But what you're saying and what I'm really interested in, why, why this explosion of ticks? And I know a lot of times we used to think it was the East Coast, but apparently it's the West Coast and now it's the Midwest. I mean, what's going on? Is it the global warming? Is it the deforestate, deforestation? Is that correct? You know, right. why, why, is, why is this thing, you know, exploding? So it's, it, that's an interesting question. I love explaining it. Um, okay. First, there, it, there, there is the, the idea that people are more aware and diagnosis is getting better. It's not perfect. Okay. Obviously, you talked to Dr. Fallon about that. Um, but you can go back in the literature and find out in the 60s and 40s and 50s, there was something known as Montauk knee. And it was that, oh, you know, explosion okay. of one single knee. It's like, okay, well, that's Lyme disease, right? That's, that's right. arthritis, Lyme right. disease. But we're seeing more. We are seeing the spread of these ticks. I mean, you can talk to people in upstate New York and they're like, we didn't have them 20 years ago. Now they're everywhere. And that is due to a couple of things. One is, is definitely our reforestation. So we as humans- Reforestation. Reforestation, right? We as humans or we as settlers of North America um, came in in the 1600s and decimated the forest, decimated the deer population. And then we as settlers realized that's not a good thing. Let's bring the deer back. Let's bring the forest back. But the forests we brought back were not continuous forests, right? They're these small plots of forest. Right. And those forests support very different animals and populations of animals. Mainly we're supporting mice and deer. And that's the perfect storm for the tick and Lyme disease. Not only that, global warming, I mean, global climate change definitely has, has, has impacted the ability for this tick to live in new areas. And I like to tell people when I, when I explain this, I like to talk about plants and, and like your garden, right? In upstate New York, I cannot grow an orange tree no matter how hard I try. Because from seed to fruit takes certain environmental conditions, right? And there's those lines that you can grow them at. Same things with ticks, right? Ticks are a two-year life cycle, especially the black-legged tick, the one that causes Lyme disease. They, have, they spend most of their life off the host in the environment exposed to the elements. Mm. Think of them like a plant. They got to grow from the seed to the adult. And when those environmental conditions get right, and that is mainly how climate change is, is basically expanding those environmental conditions that are sufficient to grow the tick, they're establishing in new areas and becoming nuisances. How are they not also like in the winter dying off because they have like mechanisms to protect themselves or? The, another cool thing, I, uh, we're reading each other's minds here. Yeah. Another cool thing is, I, so I explain this because people ask me, oh, winter's crazy. I'm like, oh, if the winter's crazy, and, and I, I did my postdoc up in the Adirondacks. So mm. Saranac Lake, coldest place oh, on man. the United States. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> they get plenty of snow, yeah. <laughs> So what, what's interesting is as I compare, so these ticks fall off the host and they basically crawl down into the dirt uh, or the leaf litter. Right. And then a snow forms on top of it. It's like an igloo. Igloos oh, isolate, you know, keep oh, that heat in. It preserves and when them. You have, yeah, when you have dirt and decaying leaf matter, that produces heat, it produces moisture. It's like a perfect place for them. But don't they need also, again, because I know that's the whole problem when they latch on to us and they suck our blood. They're blood suckers, essentially, in a sense. But yep. if they don't have that, they can, can they survive on the leaves and the dirt and everything? 
so that's interesting. So this is cool. I like I like talking about this as well because unlike mosquitoes, mosquitoes feed a lot of times. Right? They'll bite you. They'll go rest. They'll right. some eggs. They'll bite you. They, right. they can even eat sugar. Right? Mosquitoes can actually pollinate and eat sugar. That's that's an interesting thing. So they can get energy from other sources. Mm. Ticks are very different. Right? They they start as eggs and they hatch into larva and they take one blood meal, one blood meal. That's it. Then they that's it. And then they molt into nymphs. They turn mm. into another life stage and take one blood meal. And then they turn into adults. And at that stage, the female takes a blood meal. So they have very limited energy. So when they're full of blood, they're processing that and they're mm. going to the next stage. But if they don't get a blood meal, they will die. And, you know, ticks don't move much. That's like mosquitoes fly a lot. Yeah, they right. They're not, they're, exactly. They're not like the most uh, mobile critters there. <laughs> they could crawl up and down, up and down, up and down. And they, they only do that so many times before they need a, a, a meal and energy. Eventually they'll die. And there is a lot of mortality. So an, an adult female can lay about 3,000 eggs. Wow. But they're, you know, but a lot, a lot of them die. So there's a lot of mortality from that larval stage where they, where they don't get a host, they don't get a blood meal, they just run right. out of energy. Why is it, you know, back in the day, uh, maybe it was, I don't know, again, this is all pre-COVID, it's hard to remember a lot of things, you know, <laughs> when we had like the West Nile virus scare, I mean, people were afraid, right. they had people stay in your house, we're doing spraying. You know, and I, how effective it was, I don't know. I guess it was a lot of it, you know, uh, mental. Everybody felt like, okay, it's safer to go out now. Why is it they haven't figured out a way to, well, I'll, I'll, I'm going to bring up one other point. I just thought of this on the fly. Why haven't they thought of a way to rid, you know, get rid of the ticks either through, unfortunately, pesticide or I remember they were going to do an experiment. You're probably very aware of this. It was on one of the... Um, off the coast of Massachusetts, one of the islands there, they were, I was reading some of, they were doing an experiment where they were going to, I guess for the Ixiotes damnini, the Lyme one, I believe, they were mm -hmm. going to do something to the females or something so that they couldn't replicate. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember reading about that. And I, there was a lot of controversy, a lot of town was having a fight about this here. You're, you know, you're infected in the environment, but it, somebody said it was a very interesting solution. Like why, why are there no solutions to this tick uh, explosion? I it's a great question because still nowadays you'll you'll hear news about triple E, right? Eastern equine encephalitis and yeah. you know tested positive. Let's go, you know, pesticide the, the whole swamp. Right. Um, they don't do it for Lyme disease, despite some areas, 75% of the ticks are infected with the disease or wow. the pathogen, right? Wow. Where, where the mosquitoes, it's like a, 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 a fraction of a percentage. Right. Um, and a lot of it is just, I think as humans, we begin to live with it. Um, we kind of, in some areas, it's like, well, that's always a risk. It's there. You know, it's like COVID. We're starting to live with it. Um, there are some really cool things on the horizon. You talked about like sterilizing females. There's, there's a, there's a, um, a mouse vaccine, an edible mouse vaccine that actually, right. will, I think be, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, will actually um, cure the tick of the pathogen, um, which, which is kind of a neat idea. Now it's not going to be the silver bullet. There's a lot of other organisms this tick feeds on chipmunks, birds that carry the disease. So it's not the silver bullet, but it's this integrated approach. Mm. You talk about the islands off of Maine, there's this, there's this idea, and this is a pretty controversial one, is they're, they want to genetically modify mice um, and release mm. them into the wild. Maybe that's what I read too, right. Yeah, right, so that's right. a really cool. The problem with genetic modification is a lot of times it's not uh, reversible. It sounds so, like Jurassic Park kind of thing. Like right. before, all of a sudden now we get these mice that are... Uh... 10 times bigger than they were, right? <laughs> right, yeah. right. But, but there's a lot of cool things on the horizon. There's also a Lyme vaccine um, that, that's in phase three trials. Is um, it? I know the early one failed because unfortunately it seemed to be inducing the disease. It, there, was was, this, there was this yeah. idea that it induced arthritis. Um, yeah. It wasn't actually proven, but it was right around the time that um, the, the MMR was associated mm. with autism. And there was yeah. this- Oh, I see, issue. okay. Mm. And, but, but now they're just, they've re-engineered the vaccine to get rid of that epitope that they were concerned mm. about. And it's in phase three trials. The problem is it's just Lyme disease. It's not for Well, that's what I'm you too, because you're, I mean, again, you being the tick expert, you know, I, I, you know, and typically when I have a patient that's had a tick bite, like I just had one actually last week and I saw the rash and I said, mm, this looks like Lyme. And we're not waiting, you know, whatever. I sent off the bloods. It came back actually, it was kind of like borderline for allergiosis. So my question to you is, I'm not so sure it was hundred percent. That's the problem, but she was treated anyway. But yeah. how often, again, do these ticks have just one bacterium? Is it multiple usually? I mean, what's the, uh, What's the, the usual uh, combination there? 
it really depends on the area, right? These yeah. these ticks can vary. Like one backyard can vary from another backyard, but okay. you do see three to four pathogens in some of these ticks, right? And they're not just, you know, luckily a lot of them are back bacterial. So Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, Borrelia, right. they're treated with doxy, right? Right. It's right. something that could be but you got to worry about the babesias, right? That are protozoal, that, that doxy is not, they're not going to respond to doxy or the viruses, right? You've got Powassan yeah. deer tick virus, bourbon heartland virus, which have no treatment, right? Except for supportive care, you know, with symptoms. So, you know, it, 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 you can, you can easily, you know, some areas, 14%, 10% of ticks can be double infected, triple. I've seen quadruple infected. Um, obviously Lyme is the, the head, the heavy hitter there. They, it gets in high. Is it numbers. the most, is it, is it the most predominant, would you say in your, yeah. In right it, it, in, in 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 the whole north uh, northern hemisphere it's the most predominant um you know not just in north america but but in other areas it's the most predominant and then i would look at like anaplasma and babesia being at 10 to 20 percent in very endemic areas whereas mm -hmm. lyme can be 75 percent of the ticks are carrying mm -hmm. all right so let me ask you this because obviously as i mentioned right at the, at the top of the the podcast um we've all been pushed to go outdoors more, you know, and, uh, you know, we don't, again, it's just another way to escape the COVID, uh, isolation. Um, and, you know, people like to go into the park, you know, whether it's central park, people like to go play golf, uh, you know, um, you know, kids like to go camping. What, what do you tell people, you know, as far as, you know, whether it's like, you know, get baseball fields, soccer fields, what are those fairly safe? Cause they're treated with pesticides and stuff like that too. I mean, again, are you, I, I see a look at your face. It's like, it depends, <laughs> but um, I mean, cause obviously the, the, the next question after that's going to be, well, how do we protect ourselves? So what would you say, you know, a parent has a child, they're going off to camp. They're going to be playing in the grass. I mean, they're not keeping them in a shed all day long, you know, whatever. They're going to be on the baseball field, the soccer field. You know, there are people that love playing golf and, you know, I, I actually was playing tennis this morning. I, I like to play on the grass. <laughs> what <laughs> um, what do you tell them, you know, that how how concerned do parents have to be? And I guess, you know, the follow up question to that is what precautions would you take for your own kids, you know, so that all of our kids could be protected like yours? Because <laughs> I have two young ones. I have a four year old and a 10 month old. So oh, wow. um, I will give you the best precautions because okay. when I'm out, Ticks are everywhere. I'm. I'm in the. I'm outer sure bank. you. I'm sure you have like laser eyes. You. You see them like <laughs> hiding behind a tree or something. You know. So right. They're. They're just everywhere, and you have to be aware of that. Whether it's in the middle of your yard, they can survive there. Not as well as the edge of your yard near the forest. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I can go right out to the dunes here and pick up a couple ticks in the outer banks. Right. There's a certain tick that that will be out here. So you just need to be aware that they're out there, and then when you're done with outdoor activities. And when I'm outside, I'm always looking down at my legs because that's where they're grabbing on. They're, your feet, yeah, legs, sure, and I'm always right. looking down. When I see them attach, take them, throw them away. Well, what you know, if sometimes like this patient, sometimes they get it on their upper shoulder. How does that happen? They, Because they, they had time to crawl all the way up. Wow, wow, wow. Because right? it's like, yep. I don't know, for some reason, like you just, I don't know. I don't remember seeing like on the bottom of people's feet, a tick bite, you know, like sometimes people say, well, that's I've had people show me on women on their breast. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, it, it's, they, they want to go to, so ticks evolutionarily want to go to an area where they're not going to get caught. Right. Mm -hmm. So on mice, we see ticks in areas where the, where the mice can't groom. Mm -hmm. Right. So in humans, they're going to go to areas where they're going to be less likely to be found. Um, yeah. Armpit growing, these moist, dark areas. Right. And that's just where, where, where you get them. Um, so be aware that they're out there. Um, now, they're not out in a parking lot. So if you're in a parking lot, you're not going to get a tick, right? <laughs> but anywhere right, anywhere else, you are gonna you could find a tick, right? Um, you, you know, you're not going to find it in the, in the local Walmart. Um, but <laughs> what do you do when you're out to prevent? prevent? So what, do, what I do is I like to use um, on clothing is a, is a spray called permethrin. Um, there's a couple brands out there. It's only for clothing. You don't spray it on your skin. You treat your clothes. I like to treat my tennis shoes, my socks with it. Interesting. I do it for my kids. Interesting. Their shoes I treat with permethrin. You spray it, you let it dry. You got to let it dry because when it's wet, it's very toxic to cats uh, when it comes uh -huh. out of the bottle. Uh -huh. Once it dries, it's fine. If it gets wet again, it's still fine for your cats. Right. But when it comes out of the bottle, it's toxic. So you spray okay. your stuff with that. That's right. really good, really good preventative. Um, what does it do? Does it kill or just it, it just deters them or like it no, repels it, them? It, or? It, 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 
it kills them. So once, once they touch it, it, it does what the, the, the tick does a hot foot and they, 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 they just start mm. freaking mm. out and they, they mm. drop off. So it, mm. it, it actually deters and kills unlike a repellent, which just, you know, deters them. This will actually right. kill them. Right. Um, so I, I've, like, never found, I've never found reason. mosquito repellent stuff works. You know, I mean, I've been in such unfortunately yeah. bad situations and it's like, you just feel like you're spraying and like just getting in your eyes yeah. and it's a mess, you know? Yeah. And, and, and the other thing you can do and for your skin, because people sometimes, you know, not so much, I don't like to keep, treat my kids on my skin. The permethrin works mm. really good on their clothes. Mm. Skin, you can use like a 20% DEET or picaridin based spray. Um, that works um, fairly well. I don't use it. I'm sorry, I, what, kind of spray, what kind of spray is that? P picaridin or DEET. Or um, DEET. 20%. On, on their skin? Even, mm -hmm. On their skin. That's for the skin, yes. It, it's like the mosquito tick spray you see with, you know, the major brands. And, you, um, and then you said with the permethrin, permethrin if i'm saying that right that that also can okay, you would mainly spray on the shoes and the lower pants like not all over only on your clothes yep only on your clothes. clothes you can use it for your you can use it for your like your hat because it, it'll it'll also repel uh, mosquitoes as well so it's kind of right. a double yeah double yeah. black flies yeah i know yeah, i mean, used to hear the stories about the people when they go to a trips to africa or whatever they're busy spraying this stuff all over them you know to yeah and a uh, lot, you know, you can actually buy clothes that are pre-treated. You can go to like a sporting store and they'll have clothes that are pre-treated with permethrin and they'll last that like 70 I mean, I mean it, it does. The, even if you wash it once or something? It. Oh, really? Well, that's a good point. And even if you wash it, some of it still stays on there. And uh, some of these are good up to 70 washes. Wow. When, that's when good. You, and when sporting you treat, stores, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. When, so when you treat, it's, it's good for about six washes, but, right. the, but the military uses it for, for our combat troops when that's they deploy. That's very interesting. Wow. That's very interesting. I mean, I think hopefully our listeners are getting some really nice little tips here because again, I, I have also another colleague of mine. She loves going hiking. I mean, yeah. and she'll tell me she'll come back. She's, she's taking 10, 10, 20 ticks off of her, yep. which to me would repel me from going in the first place. <laughs> but you know, another big source of this that people have to be aware of, unfortunately, is when you have an indoor outdoor pet, right? I'm mean, dogs, cats, sure. I mean, you know, the, the pets that you love, I have a cat, I love a cat, she's 17 years old. And you know, we do get her that um, the flea thing, whatever, too. And yep. I guess there's a tick thing, we put a little thing on her head and, you know, yep. a little pellet, you know, every one every two, three months. Does that work? And I mean, or do you have to just be careful when they come back in to kind of because, you know, we're sitting there petting her and, and everything. They're actually very effective. The, the, the tick repellents for, for animals are very effective. And I, I recommend anybody that has an outdoor pet to do that because pets are tick vacuums, especially yeah, dogs. Right. Um, so, so, you know, what we use, you know, we can actually, you can actually look what at is, What is in the repellent? What, is, what are they actually, do you know the chemical they're, most they're, Well, a lot of them are, um, there's a couple different things, um, not just repellents, but also mm. um, um, killing agents, a caricides that kill. Um, there's a couple different, some are growth regulating factors that actually kill the insect from a growth side. There's a lot of different things, but, um, mm. but it actually just kind of oils on their whole skin. Um, but I tell people like your dog, like when we go to sites that are, have little small tick populations, dogs will find ticks. A human will never get a tick. You'll notice ticks on dogs first. They're Why? very good. Because they're low to the ground or they, they play around the yeah, dirt. I know, I, you don't know. Yeah, I guess they're like tick sweepers, right? I, wow. I, I guess. I guess, it stays on, I guess they have longer, some of them have longer hair, just kind of, it's a yeah. good to latch on. It's and like a nice ride the, for the tick, you know? Right. And they're closer to the ground. So we'll all, we'll almost always uh, get uh, reports of ticks on dogs before we get ticks on humans at new sites. Um, yeah. So it is important to, to, to treat your dogs. There's also a Lyme vaccine for dogs um, that you can get from your veterinarian. Um, very important to do. And you think um, that would help stop the transmission to you because it would block theoretically well, or no? If you think about it, I mean, you don't, want, ticket, you, don't, you don't want your dog to get Lyme disease. It's hard, awful when they have to have when, you know, when a ticket, yeah. when a tick attaches, it's not going to detach till it's done feeding and then it's going to fall off and then it's going to molt. If it falls off at your house, you're going to see it. I mean, it's going to be yeah. this little round blob or it's going to die because your house is not the right place to go through molting. Yeah. Um, so once a tick attaches to your your little furry friend, they, they don't really don't stand a, a threat to you. It's when they're they haven't attached yet and you're petting, they may crawl on your arm or something like that. Um, but that that's where you have to really be worried. But you should treat your animals definitely. Is there a worse time of the day with the tick thing? They they feed more in the morning or at night. If you're going to go out and do stuff, I mean, if you want to again advise our listeners, what would what would you say? Does it matter? <laughs> this is a cool. We're we're actually writing a paper right now where we um where we looked at um diurnal questing so questing ticks quest they look for a blood meal it's all you know very mm, nightly yeah sure um, and they quest during the day and we looked at compared to it at night 
And ticks quest all times of the day, all mm. times of the night. There's a population out there all the time. Now, sometimes there's less. Like if it's really windy, if it's really hot, ticks are, are, are really prone to drying out. So they're less likely to be out, but there still will be some. I mean, I tell, you know, people say, well, you don't collect ticks when it's raining. Oh, you can get ticks when it's raining. Uh, trust yeah. me, I know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, really, they're out there all the time. In the mo early mornings, in the late afternoons, when it's really you know, humid, when it's, when it's low, low light, um, low wind, that's a really good time to collect ticks. But any time of the day, you, you can find a tick, mm, okay. except in a parking lot. Yeah, mm, who wants to live in a parking lot? Um, <laughs> let me ask you this now, because this comes up with uh, patients of mine. They sometimes, fortunately, see the tick on them. And well, okay, let's talk about the two things. They see the tick on them. What's the best way to remove a tick? I've, I've heard different things. They say, take a, a tweezer very carefully. <laughs> People used to burn the tick, you know, I don't know, you'll set yourself on fire. What's the, if, you know, again, if someone you knew, because I know you're in your hazmat suit, you're not getting bit. But, <laughs> no. uh, but if somebody did have, see the tick on them, what's the best way? Because apparently it's almost like with the, uh, you know, I did like over the years with a lot of dealt with, you know, my allergy side, I dealt with bee stings and all that stuff too. And they tell you, of course, you know, don't ever like try to like pinch it off because it releases the sac or the venom into you. So right. what's the best way to remove a tick? Right, so I, I've heard I've heard all the stories. I'm you know, sure. Um, you know, even doing the hokey pokey may may, may get them out. Right. Uh, yeah. The the best way to remove the tick is just to take some tweezers and to grasp the tick right at the base of the skin and just pull straight pull straight up. up. Yeah. And it will it will detach. And then they're always like, "Did I get the mouth parts? Right? Are the mouth yeah, parts still in right, there? Right. 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 Well, you you know what? If the mouth parts are still in there, your your body will work it out like a splinter. Right. Um. Mm -hmm. Most of the times, some people do rip the mouth parts. It, if the tick has transmitted something, it's already happened at that point, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like if you leave it in there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to transmit more. So, you know, don't be so concerned about I that. I mean, if you but see a little bit of blood when you pull it off, whatever, to, you don't have to go into a panic. Yeah, it's just, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. no, nothing to panic. Okay. And, but I do tell people after they pull the tick out to save that tick, right? Well, that's right. That was but, my next question. Yeah. You know, because some people do it. Some people don't. Um, some people bring it in a plastic bag to me and right. I used to send it to a local lab quest or whatever. Is it better? I remember it was in the article. I was trying to get in touch with Dr. Thangamani. I don't know if you know him, you yep. know, apparently they have like the New York ticks organization where they analyze it. Is it good to send it to a very specialized place or does it matter? I mean, can you send it to a local lab core quest and they should be able to analyze if the, uh, they should analyze what kind of tick it is and if it's carrying the bacterium. I don't think like no. the, 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 the for-profit labs do that. Um, there are mm -hmm. across the country, there are multiple places like uh, Saravan and Thangamani's, which he's a very close colleague of mine. We work half a mile away from each other. Oh, is that there, right? There's a yeah. couple places. Yeah, there's a couple places you can send these to. You know, um, nominal fee or free, uh, you can Google. Oh, it's worth you know, it. I mean, people want to know, yeah. R right, and, and you know, it's, it's just that little bit of evidence that, that, that gives the medical provider a differential, right? Absolutely. And they go, yes. Right, and then you, then then the, then your physician can sit there and take that evidence, look at the whole picture, and treat based on what they see. And that, that's the whole point. When the diagnosis is the, the diagnostic tests are so problematic, going back to clinical suspicion and signs and symptoms and all the evidence that the physician has at their at their their front, they can say, yeah. I think this could be a tick-borne disease. That, that, I think that's critical. To me, it's just the same as doing a, a throat or a sputum culture. And I'll tell you why. Because, again, cases that have come up over the years, a patient knows they got bit by a tick. They Obviously, they bring it into me. Now, they're worried. Is this going to give me Lyme disease? Now, we know that the, 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 the Lyme testing, just for example, or any of the other testing, goes by antibodies, which take time to build up. So people are like desperate. Do I start my antibiotics right now because I got bit? Or do I wait 10 days, which a lot of them don't want to do. But yet, if we could get an identification within a few days, yes, this is Ixiodes damnini or whatever the Ixiodes americano, or whatever they are, that, um, you know, then maybe it is worthwhile to start treatment immediately. Right. And, and if sense? you as a physician yeah. have, your, your, your patient brings in, I sent it to Dr. Thangamani's lab, mm. 72 hours later, it's come back as Ixiodes scapularis, it is Fed and it is carrying the Lyme pathogen. Mm. Doesn't mean that actually transmitted the pathogen, right? Who knows? Okay, but, but that gives you that evidence that says, well, let's put you on a two-week course of doxycycline. It's not right. going to hurt you, right? right. right. And, and, and it's going to only help you because we're not going to wait ten days for right. Days already, for things are, things are in action. Yeah, I mean, because the most right. 
tragic thing, unfortunately, which I see in, you know, I see chronic Lyme patients. And, you know, once this has gone, either people don't remember getting a tick bite and sick, you know, it's a whole different thing. But actually, I'm, I'm, this is a little bit of a medical question. Maybe I'm, I'm not sure if this is in your purview or not. But, you know, similar to COVID, you know, some of the, the current thinking on COVID, let's say long haul COVID, um, they don't believe that the patients are still infected with the coronavirus. It's just the inflammation due to something that's happened in the immune system. Right. Do you, I don't know if you have any thoughts from again, all your experience that maybe that's what's going on. I mean, do these ticks live on in people? Let's say, let's say someone's been treated, but you know, months later, they're clearly having, if they've had, let's say a, a heart issue, like we like pericarditis or joint pain, for some reason, it didn't knock it out. Is it so much that the tick, that the bacterium has lived on? And do you have a thoughts on that? Or is it more, it's just probably the inflammation? I, I do have thoughts on that. And there is some, some cutting edge science coming out of a couple labs across yeah. the country. Now, there's always the chance, and I'm a scientist, there's no black and white, there's always a gray, right? And there's always the chance that there could be a lingering infection. I mean, there, okay. you know, who knows, right? I don't think that's causing the 10 to 20% of the majority of people, or no, 10 to 20% of people that get Lyme have these lingering long symptoms like with COVID. Right. Um, and there's some labs, there's, there's, there's a colleague's lab of the Lockheed lab over at the University of uh, College, uh, Wisconsin Medical College, as well as the Jutris lab at Virginia Tech that are showing things like um, after infection, uh, it can change your, your immune cells, right? Mm. Uh, it changes microRNA expression. And it basically, your immune cells are not the same that they were before. Right. And That's you are like a changed COVID. person. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. the Jutris lab at Virginia Tech is showing how that. Do spell, how, do you, how do you spell that? I'm sorry. The J-U-T-R-A-S. J- J- Brandon J- Jutris. Yeah. He's at Virginia Tech. He's in the biochem department. He's showing um, that the spirochetes, like if they get into the joints, they'll leave some of their peptidoglycan, their, their mm. cell wall behind. Mm. And that's causing you know, a mm. consistent response of your immune system and some of the potentially of these, these, uh, these, these long symptoms, whether it's in the joints, in, in the brain or in the heart, um, you know, some of these things. So it's, there's some really cool things going on. I think with long COVID getting such a, a, a good hype here, we're going to see a lot of cool advances with, with a chronic Lyme or PTLDS, whatever you refer to it as, mm. and hopefully get some answers for people so they feel better because there's no doubt people are suffering and are changed after getting bitten by a tick with Lyme disease. Yeah, I mean, one of the most dramatic things, I don't know if you read this, I, I mentioned it on some prior, prior podcast, you know, Ross Dutat, who's a New York Times uh, op-ed editorial writer, excellent writer, he wrote a book called, I think it was called Deep Places, and it was really about his journey and experience with most likely chronic Lyme. I mean, he became really ill. It just basically um, stopped him in his tracks, you know, and the whole mental, physical issues. And fortunately, I think he's getting a little better now. But, uh, you know, I I sometimes tell, um, you know, I tell my patients and I, I speak with other colleagues about this. I said, sometimes, you know, your best teacher is a patient that's had the disease. You know, because they know they, they are the native of the land. You know, as doctors, we see people, you know, with the tourists, we see people coming in and out, you know, and, you know, when you, you're living with this 24 seven, you know, you know, your body and, uh, and unfortunately, well, I, like, you know. Yeah, Dean, I, I tell people and I, I hear, I hear the stories all the time. And the only right now, it, it's going to be, it's going to be time before we can maybe never cure long COVID or long or chronic Lyme. So really prevention is the key. You don't want to get sick. You don't walk into a place going, I'm going to get an infectious disease. But we have people that go out and don't take precautions, right? Think about, and I think about it because I'm, I have a public health background. I think about like seatbelts, right? In the 1970s, right? When, when did seatbelts become required? Now it's like second nature. You just put right. your seatbelt on. Oh, you don't even yes. think about well, it. You know, or your car will be beeping the whole time. It's great. They, it basically forces you to right. comply, right? Mm-hmm. And it's sunscreen, right? If you go to the beach, you put sunscreen on. You know, these are things that we've pushed from a public health perspective mm-hmm. that have saved lives. Mm-hmm. And that's what we need to be doing with ticks and tick-borne diseases. Because, Dean, if you look at the numbers, the, 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 the two groups that are suffering most from at least Lyme disease are children under the age of 15 mm. and um, older individuals over the age of 60. Mm, and that terrifies me because if you think about long or chronic mm. Lyme disease, you mm. do not want your child to suffer for their whole life. 
So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I mean, it, it just, it is what it is. That must be the, I think that's the most important thing that we've even, that you've said this whole podcast. I mean, you've talked about a lot of interesting things and I've learned a lot. Um, but I think, yeah, reinforcing prevention, you know, again, almost like sunscreen for getting sunburns. I mean, I was, I'm going to have a dermatology podcast in a few weeks and, and I recently had uh, some skin cancer and I know it was from growing up, I was a tennis player. Nobody ever put sunscreen on us. You know, I was out for hours in the sun. You know, now I, um, <laughs> I look like a white ghost <laughs> when I go out, but, um, I want to ask you one more thing. It's, well, so I want to kind of build, it's kind yeah, sure. of hard for people that are suffering to see prevention, how important it is. Cause they yes. want to, they want to fix themselves then and there. Right. But, and, and that's where every, all the focus is right. Cure vaccine, all this, you know, yeah, right, diagnostics, right, right. but don't get it in the first place. And I think yeah. any patient would say, I wish I didn't have this in the first place. I know, 100%. You're 100%. How do you, uh, I mean, it looks a little bit obvious from the photo in the Times. How, I mean, because you're, you're out there. You're like in the, you're in the, the battle. How do you prevent right. yourself from getting, uh, getting a bit? Well, so if I'm out there collecting, I, I'm wearing that suit. And that suit's interesting because it's everything sewn up. There's no way a tick can get in except it has. And I, 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 you know, duct tape my socks to my leg. The only way a tick can get in it has to crawl up to my collar and come down my collar. So um, we- And do you, and we, you have like a special thing for your face too? It's almost like a bee thing, like where you have like a- Sometimes if the mosquitoes are bad, um, we, I'll, I'll, the wear, I'll wear a netting. But but for ticks, I'll catch them because it takes a while for them. They're not that fast. It takes a while for them to crawl up. We get ticks on on, on ourselves all the time. Uh -huh. I mean, we, we are basically just as good as that white flag of collecting ticks. And we'll take them off and put them in a tube. Um, so it's just being aware and knowing how to pinpoint them. And they're not easy to spot, especially the, the nymphal stages. Well, that's the other very, point very, too, right. You know, when I tell, uh, when I gave a lecture on this, you know, it, it even startled me is that, you know, they say that the tick is the size, you know, of uh, a pencil eraser, right? I mean, or maybe even smaller. That's the adult tick. The, yeah, the that's, nymph's that's probably the size of the, pen, the pencil tip. Really? Hmm. Yeah. Wow. And so, so it's, you know, it is, it's, it's hard. Um, so if you get a chance to see them in, in real life, look at them and remember that, right. Be like, mm. oh, that's really small. And just, just take, take a look at that and, and just kind of, because I can spot them, like you said, a mile away, right. Drop, you know, climbing on a piece of grass. Uh, I, I can't actually do that. But when I pull that white cloth up, I can see them immediately because I've been doing it for so long, but it right. just takes you know, uh, and you can go online nowadays with, with, with Google, with all this stuff, you go online and look at them yeah. and look at them in, 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 in contrast to something of a size reference, just so you're, you're aware. Yeah. You know, I just want to share with the listeners that sure. in the last decade too, there was a very interesting issue with ticks in my area too, of allergy and immunology. So the story went, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of this, but the story went, it was back, I guess, probably around 2010, there were some of these cases arising where people would be eating red meat and they would start to break out in hives, have trouble breathing, you know, a, whole, a serious thing, you know, and sometimes immediately or sometimes even a couple, like an hour or two after eating a meal. And this, this some of the, the earliest cases, uh, I believe, were out in the Hamptons, you know, in the fancy areas there, people are eating the nice steak dinner, you know, and all of a sudden have trouble breathing. So these patients went to the local allergist there who was actually seeing a bunch of the cases and tested them for beef and you know other things and they were negative so it was a little bit of a mystery and then um there's a uh dr platts mills at the university of virginia he's like one of the top allergy immunology academics he started collecting data on this because i think he also saw in virginia some of these similar stories and what they found out which was really fascinating was that what was happening was that um, these pa these people have been bitten by a tick called I think it's Ixiodes americana, the one that the Lone Star tick, yeah, Amblyomma americana. Amblyomma, thank you. And uh, it was somehow inducing uh, an IgE response to the um, oligosaccharide, I believe, in you know within the mammalian. Uh, mammalian meats and stuff like that. And so anyway, these people were getting like this delayed allergic reaction that we did, we do have a test for now, but it was very, you know, it was very bizarre and mystifying to patients. Like here we were, my whole life I had steak or I had this, 
and now all of a sudden they had this problem. There's actually certain medications they can't take either because there's some kind of cross reaction. I think there's a, I don't know if it's rituximin or one of the, one of the, um, I think it's a chemotherapy agent. You so know. that's, that, that's where it started. Actually, it was that mm. it was the, the small non-cell uh, carcinoma right. drug when they were doing clinical trials, they had noticed that people in the South were having allergic reactions to the drug. Uh-huh. And they're like, what is the epidemiologist goes, well, that also overlaps the Lone Star tick distribution. And they oh, realized they wow. were making this drug in mice and that was causing this reaction to the oh, alpha wow. gal. Wow. Alpha gal. Right. And then as alpha the gal, tick right. has spread, she, more people are getting bit and it's, it's some protein in the saliva where you're getting a, an adverse reaction, IgE mm. sensitivity to the alpha galacto uh, uh, polysaccharide and it's making you allergic to, to red meat. And for me, that's terrifying because I am a meat eater at large. And, mm-hmm. um, um, and I don't know that, you know, it's such a new thing. I've been bitten by a lot of Lone Star ticks because I did a lot of work in the South and we mm-hmm. would get inundated by them. So there may be an individual kind of reaction to this as well. But, um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's terrifying to think about ne- never having a nice filet mignon again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other thing too, because sometimes when I visit some friends out East on Long Island and I am driving through and I see deer, I, I, is that is that the sign to start to pull up your socks, you know, to <laughs> be a little safe? I mean, going back to you should pull up your socks all the time, kind of I know, thing. I but yeah, anyway. deer, right? Deer are become deer are a nuisance. Um, they don't actually. It's funny. I like to tell people they don't actually get Lyme disease. They they don't carry the bacterium. The deer oh. are really important for the adult uh, a tick. So the adult tick don't feed on small animals. You'll never find them on a mouse. They need larger animals like deer. So deer support that population through feeding the of the I adult see. tick but they're everywhere i mean deer are everywhere they're nuisances um you'll never control them enough to get the tick population down it's very hard to do that right um but uh you know if you see deer around yeah you got to be worried about ticks one of the last thing too the beach do you have to worry at the beach do ticks like to hang out there i'm here right now i'm in the four-wheel drive area of the i'm in Corolla, north carolina um where I grew up, you know, the weekend, my whole life. Yes, you do. There are some ticks. They're, on the, they're in the sand. They're in the... On a sand dune, yep. Yeah. Uh, Amblyoma wow. maculate, maculatum, especially the Gulf Coast tick, um, is very um, uh, prone to being in dry areas. Um, and they can cause a disease called a rickettsia parkeri. It's a rickettsiosis. It's, a, it's That's not like Rocky, Rocky Mountain Fever. Is, is that the same family as Rocky Mountain, that, but not as sick? Yeah, it's not yeah. the same. It causes a small eschar, um, and it's not as fatal, um, at, but, but people do get it. And then the, the the Lone Star tick can also um, survive, and, and I I, I, pick, I can pick a Lone Star tick up out my uh, in my quote unquote yard, which is sand dunes and 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 you know, seagrass. Mm. Um, so so they're they're pretty they're pretty good in in these dry environments. Now Lyme disease, you really need those those more humid environments to to pick them up. But um, but definitely other ticks. I mean there there's a bunch of there's a bunch of ticks out there, and uh, you never know when you're going to pick one up, except in a parking lot. Yeah, well. Brian, I have to thank you for coming on. I have learned so much. I've learned to appreciate parking lots now. Um, <laughs> I hope all the listeners have really gotten a lot out of this. Is there anywhere we could send people if they want to know more about your work? Uh, what you guys? Yeah, you can. Um, uh, you can just you can Google me. Um, but I but I have a website, Ledet Lab. Um, uh, you you could find me. I'm 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 all over. Um, the New York Times article definitely is a good yeah, place to start. Yeah, that's nice. It was really, it was a really good article. Very interesting. So um, so so look me up. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I'm I'm always open to 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 talk and text with people. It's it's just a fun thing to do. I think um, it's a weird hobby, but I like it. No, it's great. It's great that you're so um, you know, open to that. Anyway, so for my listeners, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Please leave a review if you enjoyed what we talked about today. It really helps boost the visibility of the podcast. And we've been interviewing so many terrific guests from so many areas of, of health and medicine. Uh, so thank you.